Start your day with It's the Business. Here's Phil Dobby. Well, today, are you preparing your business for the end of lockdown? Entrepreneur Richard Crawford Small says don't just reopen, you have to relaunch. Go for it. Honestly, go for it. it it's gonna like you've just opened for the first time ever. And think about all the you know the energy and enthusiasm. You've got to put energy back into into the market. Don't just go right doors open. Stick a sign outside. Sit there and like, wait for the customer to come back in. That's coming up today. Plus, Matthias Corman, the next head of the OECD. So, who is he? And what does the OECD do, do anyway? Well, I tell you what he's going to do for the OECD. He is going to be focused on outcomes. I'm going to be very outcomes focused. I'm going to be focused on uh, bringing people together, uh, on uh, building consensus uh, and making sure that uh, you know we deploy all of the policy and analytical capabilities of the OECD to maximum effect. So other than his ability to talk about nothing at all, is he the right man for the job? Plus... Don't mention the M word. That's m- 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 I better not say it because we're going to get blocked. It's Wednesday, the 17th of March, 2021. Good morning. And now it's the business making sense of it all with Phil Dobby. I have to say it is so good that now we can talk about Memphis again, particularly on social media, because for a while there, whatever you do, don't mention the word Memphis, because for some reason... I don't know, perhaps it's because it contained the word men, and some people might find that offensive. You couldn't use the word Memphis on Twitter. Twitter would block you for 12 hours if you use that word longer, if you actually refused to delete the tweet that had the offensive word Memphis in it. Now, Twitter have said it was an error. They've corrected it and uh, offered no explanation of why it happened. I think Gizmodo put it fairly well, though. They said there's a certain irony in seeing Twitter's swift crackdown on the word Memphis after years of struggling to moderate the rampant abuse and bigotry on its platform. But the uh, but they say that's Twitter for you, an online haven for literal Nazis. But God forbid you tweet about the re- birthplace of rock and roll. So I wonder if uh, you could actually have got around it by posting extracts from songs which contain the word Memphis because there's been quite a few of them and then I thought well you know let's have a bit of a musical challenge just for a bit of a diversion middle of the week on it's the business here's a chunk of songs that have got the word Memphis in it this is pretty impossible but if you can get them or you can get most of them send me an email phil at it's the dot business at this rarely used email address, <laughs> Phil at it's the dot business. How many of these songs can you identify? Or at least get the artists right. They come at you really quickly. And look, I used to do this on the radio years ago, and I used to have this belief that if you're going to do musical quizzes, make them as difficult as possible. I worked for a radio station in Southampton. I won't say which one it is, but it was in Southampton. It was run by the BBC, and they had mystery voice competitions, which were just piss easy. It was like, who's this? She's the ruling monarch. There's a clue. Uh... <laughs> Then, and, you know, people would call up because it was so easy. Is it the Queen, Phil? How did you get that? You are so clever. But if you make it really difficult, I guarantee someone is going to respond to this because they just want to show how clever they are. Here are the songs. Uh, tell me if you can identify the artists. Stop being on music radio again. Memphis. Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, my man to Memphis. There's a lot on in Memphis. You've got to move Memphis. Yeah, someone's going to get that. There's eight of them there. Songs with Memphis in them. Email me just so I know that you're there. Phil at it's the dot business. Uh, go on, tell us what they are. Show off how much you know. Now, look, the OECD is now going to be headed by a right winger whose heart really isn't in tackling climate change, that's for sure. Matthias Cormann, you've probably never heard of him, but he is the uh, former Aussie Minister for Finance. He's been voted into the role. There was a letter sent from the Greens in Australia to the OECD's voting bloc highlighting how in government he'd voted to repeal Australia's carbon pricing scheme, how he'd uh, abolished the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and the Renewable Energy Agency. He worked for Prime Minister Tony Abbott, who saw climate change as, in his words, crap, 
And uh, in a speech in London, he said it was uh, climate change was probably doing good. He, he likened policies to combat it to primitive people once killing goats to appease the volcano gods. And Matthias Cormann worked alongside Tony Abbott, didn't say anything about it. So we have certainly uh, g- given way to any idea of progressive thinking coming out of the OECD. In fact, he was interviewed by the Australian Financial Review yesterday and in it, He said commitment to democracy, the rule of law, human rights, market-based economic principles and a rules-based international order should remain unchanged as the world recovers from the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm not sure that's going to work. Does he realise that the rules have already changed? I mean, the the market-based economic principles are being driven by governments issuing debt that's bought up by central banks who use targeted bond purchases to subdue the interest rate, which helps lift asset prices, including shares and commodities. How is any of that market-based, I wonder? Uh, but just ignore, ignoring that slight deviation from the norm, from the market principles, uh, he doesn't want to see carbon tariffs being introduced against countries that don't have a carbon price, which is what the EU wants to do, because he thinks it's going to have an impact on global trade and the world economy. You know what? If you're going to reduce the impact of carbon on the planet, you have to have an impact on global trade and the world economy, don't you? We have to slow it down. We have to slow down consumption, unless anyone's got any brighter ideas, because I tell you, just improving the uh, the efficiency of energy use isn't going to solve that problem. We've got to do more than that. And when I look at the OECD website, I wonder whether they know what they're getting. Because uh, I had this question in the back of my mind. I had to go to the, the OECD website because I had this question in the back of my mind. What exactly does the OECD do? And that's the only saving grace we've got, actually, having Matthias Cormann heading it, is because they probably don't do a great deal. But it does say on their website, our goal is to shape policies that foster prosperity, equality, opportunity, and well-being for all. It says, we draw on 60 years of experience and insights to prepare the world for a better world tomorrow. Together with governments, policymakers, and citizens, we work on establishing evidence-based international standards and finding solutions to a range of social, economic, and environmental challenges. And the answer from Matthias Cormann, new Secretary General designate for the OECD, doesn't start till June, seems to be whatever the market decides is the answer, which is obviously bad news for Africa and the third world. In fact, anyone outside the G20. And yet here is a promotional video for the OECD from the OECD forum in 2019. It all sounds a bit progressive to me. What kind of world do you want to live in? And what kind of world do you want to leave behind for the next generation? We cannot leave it to the government. We cannot leave it to the private sectors to build this kind of vision. We all need to contribute to make this vision of the world to become reality. For social activism to achieve its mission, governments need to stop seeing protesters as adversaries and instead as the source for the momentum necessary to create great changes. You know, they don't sound like Matthias Corbyn sort of people i have to say but we'll see how it works out you know ho-hum the world is facing the greatest challenge in our lifetimes possibly for 200 years then on top of that there's the bigger issue of climate change and the oecd has voted in someone who believes you should just let the markets decide someone who believes in minimal intervention i guess he's going to look after the bigger nations of the world and forget about the rest still they do produce some useful statistics at the oecd so i suspect uh, it's going to be a rocky road for them when they find out who they've got in charge, unless Matthias Cormann undergoes a complete personality transformation, which he might do. Uh, perhaps living outside Australia will do in the world of good. He's originally from Belgium, I think, hence the strange accent. Now, look, if your business has been closed during lockdown, by the way, we'll come and have a look at the uh, uh, this morning's newspapers in a moment, but I want, I want to move on to our guest today, because if your, your business was closed during lockdown or you've managed to just about stay open uh, and you're hoping that your business is now going to pick up as life gradually returns to normal, whatever the new normal is going to be, how do you prepare for that? Do you just open your doors and hope for the best? Do you assume that your loyal customers are just itching to get back to you? I think they can be fairly dangerous assumptions, can't they? So let's look at how you do prepare your business for life after lockdown. Richard Crawford Small is an author. He's a coach, a mentor. His books include Changing Minds, A Deliberate Plan for Accidental Success. His first book was actually called Changing Faces. Now, I hadn't read it. It, it, it sounded like Changing Faces, I thought, you know, I was being funny. 
to myself when I said, ah, oh, that must be a joke about the cosmetic surgery business changing faces. And in fact, it was. I thought I, was, I wasn't being too literal. That's actually what it is. But he's moved on now from writing about facial aesthetics to, to business aesthetics. So making your business look a, a little bit better as well, which is uh, quite a task right now, isn't it? I mean, businesses have been knocked about a bit, haven't they, over the last year? But this is this is very much a focus now, isn't it? The, the aesthetics of a, of a good business. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there are um, transferable messages across the board. So, um, but thank you for inviting me today. And um, yeah, it's it's about there's universal marketing lessons in a lot of things, and mm. um, the the crossover from uh, aesthetics into the general business world is you know it, business is business at, at the end of the day. And I think um, my sector had a very you know rough ride straight into into lockdown because essentially with less than about a week's notice, they had to close their doors, which their ability to generate revenue essentially ended. Yeah, well, for the whole of uh, personal services, I mean, you know, we're all desperate, aren't we, to get our hair cut? Well, maybe except for you. I'm looking at this on video. Perhaps uh, less of a concern for you. So I, I still want this, I, I still have a pretty, he, he, you know, good old beard do, going on here. And yeah. this, <laughs> it's just like, you know, hair is in very different places. I'd still like someone to go in there to take this down a notch yeah, for yeah. me. So, okay, so you've come up with six uh, ideas. And the reason I wanted to get you on, because I really do like these. You know, I'm a, a marketing guy as well. So, you know, I sort of understand the importance of getting the image and the message right. Uh, but I like your starting point. So let's go through your six. Number one is facial fears now. You've, there's a, you've got to go through a bit of a reality check right now, haven't you? Definitely. Um, I think there's... Uh, going to be an element of um you know mindset shift and and people have possibly been used to being you know indoors some have turned their hands to kind of different different things to mm. make money and all of a sudden you've got to think back to right my business what was it what i was doing how was i working beforehand and i get there's a quite a lot of anxiety with that that comes with that so but getting ahead of the game understanding what it is that you're worried about you know is it worried about clients not coming back through the door are you worried about not being able to generate any revenue have you got essentially your products and services do you think that they're still fit for service you know because the market has yeah. changed we don't we, i don't yeah. think we're really going to know how it's changed until it's open you know we've got to look retrospectively and are you going to have to diversify things. and are you going to be up to that you know are you going to be able to learn new skills for example that are required to uh, diversify you're going to have all of those concerns aren't you uh, yeah i mean the diversification again that's key i mean if you haven't been well especially in the service-based industry if you've not been looking online then you you know you're kind of running out of time in a sense to be able to do that. So in John Lewis was saying that seventy three percent of their revenue expecting to come through online sales in the next four years. So you know if that's where that retail's going, then most service businesses are going to have to go down that route at some point. Now look, when we were setting this interview up, we didn't realise that we, we actually lived just around the corner from each other. We both we're both in Farnham, and I love there's a uh, there's a cafe that closed in the centre of Farnham that has now reopened. I think it's in different hands. It's changed its name completely. Uh, and uh, now it serves coffee and it sells you electric bikes. Have you noticed that? Yeah, I have. I yeah, the e-bike. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, isn't, isn't it wonderful, though? I mean, it's like that's one thing about the opportunity that these things present itself. And you mentioned about yeah. normal. And for me, normal ended on the 16th of March 2020. You know, normal has disappeared mm. over the hill and it's far away. It's not coming back. So you've got to adapt to what is current and what's happening and marketing practices that you've already always used are still relevant you still understand your market you still got to understand what it is that makes you different you still got to understand who you're serving and what it is they want from you it's just what they want but the market has changed. it's the market that has changed isn't yes it? you know i mean people's attitudes are going to be very different coming out of this of so the opportunities are going to be Maybe just the same, but they might be in a completely different area. Mm. You've just got to figure out what that what that is, which is why all this stuff's important, of course. So your number two is, uh, and this goes without saying, and in fact, you know, the, the line of work that you're in, you had to be right on this right from the beginning, even when you were allowed to stay open, which wasn't for long. Make sure that you're COVID safe. Yeah, I mean, it's it sounds like common sense, but when you say COVID safe, that means different things to different businesses. And... Mm. It's, you know, I think there's a, it's a, you know, one is marketable, making sure that you're COVID safe is a big sort of tick in the box. It's like being, you know, being registered with the ICO or CQC or whatever regulatory body that it's a big tick in the box. But also I think it shows that you're paying attention to your client safety. It shows you're paying attention to the, the market and the way the world is kind of shifting. Um, and also, um, you know, there are, if you go through the process of, you know, understanding what that is, opportunities again will present themselves. So, for example, in our in our market, the opportunity for for visual consultations or visual assessments um, is always there, but you can do them both through Zoom. 
So actually you're reducing the contact time for a client in the clinic by actually doing that online before they've even come into you, which saves time, makes you more efficient. So even though this is what you'd say, actually that's a real business efficiency win. And I think if you kind of go through your journey, whatever business it is, and look at, okay, well, people's perceptions have changed. People are quite comfortable with doing online consultations or assessments. Um, can I do that and can I make it stick for the long term? Number three out of your six. Uh, th- I mean, this is just the classic, isn't it, for marketing? What what makes you different? You know, the fundamentals. What is your unique selling point? Yeah, what's the USP? Um, sometimes I think about it, it's what's your superpower? And if you've been away from your business for long enough, it may have been forgotten or it might have actually changed. So a lot of people have been getting communicating online. They might have been communicating through social media. And one of the things that I've noticed with my client group is one of their sort of superpowers is, yes, they're fantastic with creating, you know, changes in people's pers- uh, people's appearance, skincare, et cetera, et cetera. But they're also amazing counsellors. And they're really good at soft skills. And because they've not been able to actually do the do, they've been talking to their clients an awful lot more and actually selling online and counseling. So the USP, things like honesty and integrity and you know leadership and all those sorts mm. of things are popping up as opposed to a year ago, it was just about, well, I, you know, I'm great at skincare. Well, that's mm. not a USP. That's no. just, you know, fundamental it's- of the job. Yeah, ex- exactly. It's just telling you what you what you do rather than actually what you're uh, what you're good at in a way which is meaningful for the customer. Because lots of people are good at their job. Uh, so how do you stand out? Absolutely. Now, look, when we uh, I said in the introduction, it, it's a dangerous assumption that your loyal customers that you had before are just itching to to get back to you. Uh, and I can give a great example of that. Why that's dangerous? Because I used to uh, frequent one coffee shop in in town regularly, almost every day. Since the lockdown, I've bought myself a coffee machine, and I reckon my coffee at home is better than the coffee I get from there. So, I mean, I'm, go- I'm still going to go and get coffees, but I'm only going to get coffee when I can sit down. I've got time to do it. I'm not takeaway coffee now is uh, extinct as far as I'm concerned. I have no need for it. And I'm sure there's going to be other occasions like that, other situations where people have found, you know, their behaviours as they were have just changed. So don't run the assumption that, uh, uh, that, that, that things are going to go back to the same uh, before. And that means getting back in touch with your client base and, and you know, trying to trying to encourage them to come back to you. Yeah, re, yeah re, you've got to reconnect with them. And uh, it, yeah. it, I've been, I've been so the guys I've been coaching and working with, I've been saying to them, actually, since don't lose touch with your clients, continue to communicate with them. But if you're hearing this and you've not done that, then now is the time. And it is reach out with your clients, find the top 20, 30 clients that you've got who you buy from you, reach out, re-engage with them, um, find out how they are. And, and you know, and actually, if you're in a service industry, you need to kind of care. So make a point of inquiring about how they are, not just, hi, how you doing? I'm opening soon. I'm going to be ready to sell to you. That'll just switch them off. So, you know, that, that reconnection message, I think, is the right one. Reconnect. Don't just try and, you know, get them back in through the door with a price tag on Right. Them. But um, that means everyone is now using email marketing a great deal, aren't they? I don't know how many emails I'm getting a day from companies that I have, uh, obviously, at some point signed up to, maybe as part of a loyalty scheme. And uh, I'm getting inundated with them. I, I just wonder whether you can get too much of this. If everyone's doing it, aren't we going to get sick of it? Yeah, it's going to get it's going to get noisier. Um, and this is where the, the the power of generate of creating a community uh, comes into its own. And social media is fantastic for that. I mean, it's you know it's great for a lot of things. It's not great for others. And one of the things that we've always been looking at, especially over lockdown, is to create smaller sort of Facebook groups or online communities of clients together and then just you know warm them up talk to them you know stay connected so when you are reopening or getting ready to relaunch your email campaign is sort of secondary to the yeah. fact that you've already got a client base there ready to buy yeah. from you and ready to engage and actually a lot of them would have been supportive throughout the whole process yeah that so, does make sense because email marketing yeah, you really are a bit just pushing a, a message out aren't you uh, and it's not really a discussion which is what you're talking about so the next one is reviewing your prices and your product offering now prices are are very, it's very difficult, isn't it, particularly for a small business to know what is the right price to charge. I mean, in large businesses, it's easier, isn't it, because you've got a lot of data that you can use. So, you know, if you push the price up too quickly, then you're going to see a lot of people leave. Uh, and that is the big fear for small businesses, isn't it? I fear that many people think, well, I better charge less than actually is the going rate because they are worried about not getting the business. It's easier to sell something if you sell cheap, but of course you are you're doing yourself out of a few quid if you do that. It's, it, it is it is challenging, and I think for as you absolutely right said, you know, small businesses I think it's more challenging than others. Um, I took 
you know, a lot of advice around pricing. I think for those sort of things, it's where a little, an external influence will help. It's difficult yeah. to be objective about pricing is it because it's like speaking and talking at the same time. You can't really do it. So you need someone to come out and have a look at your business, see the value and kind of help you understand your pricing. It's one of the tendencies is for you as well. I'll have a look at my competitors and see what they're charging. Well, what if they haven't got it right? Then what happens is the entire local market is undercharging. Um, someone's got to be the highest, so it may as well be you. But what value are you providing for that? And for pricing, for me, it's 90% mindset and belief that you are worth what you're about to charge. And if, you're, if you've been through a process like this, which is essentially the hardest trading conditions ever, you know, the ever likely to face and you're still in business at the end of it. I think you've learned a bit of resilience, right? There's a bit of bite to you. Yeah. So now is the time to push your prices up, especially if you're incurring costs because of becoming COVID safe, especially if you're incurring costs because essentially, you know, you've been not unable to trade. Um, don't be excessive because you, you don't try and recoup an entire year's lost revenue in a day. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to, cash flow forecast, of course, and do the right things. But don't be afraid of knocking your prices up. That It's going to happen across the board. Everyone's prices are going to go up. So you have to go up in line with that and do it as a percentage increase over time. Don't just you know open your doors and suddenly stick 50% on things. That, that will put people off. But 5% yeah. here, there increase over time i think that's palatable but yeah particularly when you know if you equate it with value so maybe there's something else mm. that you can add to it that uh, you know yeah. in people's minds will, will justify that extra expense but i mean there are two markets aren't there i mean the, the the population has been split in two by all of this so there's people who have sailed through who've kept their jobs are actually actually been spending less because you know in the area we where we live they're not paying that uh, 35 quid to get the train into London to, you know, their daily commute. So they've saved all that money, plus all the money they were spending on lunch and uh, all the clothes they had to wear to look smart for the office. All mm. that money's been saved. So they've got a bit, you know, a few extra quid in their pocket that they can afford. And then there's the other people who, uh, who you know, don't have jobs, have really struggled. And it's going to be very hard to sell to them, uh, you know, so we hope they get back on their feet quickly. But yeah. you shouldn't. I don't think you should say, well, okay, I need to get to those people I'm going to discount heavily. You should be focusing on those people who've got the money who can buy your services. Yeah, it's e economics, isn't it? it it's you've got to go, you know, go where the goodies are, as I was once, once told. Um, <laughs> and I mean, you make an interesting point about, you know, again, things that have changed and what's going to happen. And will the, the, not, will the commuters return? Or have they suddenly discovered that not spending mm. four hours a day traveling from Farnham into central London or, you know, I think, they're gone. I think those days have gone. I seriously believe I think 50% yeah. of the time they'll be so you've got their best. So you've got a local market and I think, you know, you've got a cafe mm. now that sells electric bikes and coffee and, you know, you've got, <laughs> but you've also got a group of people who are working from home and all of a sudden it's kind of like, right, would you know what? Yeah, I'm going to nip out and grab a coffee or I might work from somewhere else today. So there's, I th I'm interested to see what's going to happen with, you know, with these sort of local economies and how they shift to take into account, essentially, like you say, the money that's being retained locally as opposed to being spent in London, which is what used to happen. Um, so, but yeah, adding value, as you said, to things is, is, is I think, is key. Um, but don't be afraid to put, to nudge the prices up. Um, you know, you might, yeah, you'll lose a few customers, but the ones that remain are paying more, which exactly. will probably offset the ones and all that. So look, the final one, um, uh, don't just reopen. I like this. This is the key one, as far as I'm concerned, uh, because I do fear that people are just going to do this. They're just going to open the doors and say, ah, here we are. Don't just reopen. Relaunch. This is a big opportunity, isn't it? To, it is. Just, to get your name out there again. Go for it. Honestly, go for it. <laughs> it it's going to, like, you've just opened for the first time ever. And think about all the, you know, the energy and enthusiasm. You've got to put energy back into into the market, you've got to put energy, and this is we, because I think it's everybody has to do this, put energy back into the market and a little bit of a celebration, as I said, you know, you've, you've worked hard, you've come through this, you've got out the other side. Don't just go, right, doors open, stick a sign outside, sit there and like, wait for the customer to come back in. Create a campaign approach to it and start thinking about, right, well, we're going to opening on this day. I think 12th of April is the date that's been given for most businesses. You can, even, even if you've got, you've got a week, a couple of weeks beforehand, you can start to, get people excited, you know, going to open up, even to stand to the sort of things, sticking balloons outside, just rev people up um, and get people as excited as you are about the opportunity. Because I get that there is going to be quite an outpouring of emotion and there is going to be a lot of energy as people come out um, because it's been tough. And I think if you just kind of open with a little bit of a, you know, 
a sparkler rather than the Roman candle, you're going to get lost, I think, in a lot in a lot of noise. So get ahead of the game and start thinking about how you're going to yeah. do that. And it might be a sustained period as well. So uh, pub beer mm. gardens are <laughs> booked up. People are booking up for their Sunday lunch for months in advance now. If you want to go out and have uh, have your Sunday lunch at the local pub, good luck trying that before September, I think, basically. Yeah, I mean, so, it's going to be incredible. And I think, you know, we all know what this country is like when the sun's out and they haven't had the opportunity to express themselves for a while. People, people go crazy. People go yeah. Absolutely yeah. crazy. And one of the interesting things is like, is it the, the main kind of restrictions are over on the 21st of June and then England are playing Czechoslovakia in the European Championships on the 22nd of June. So, you know, <laughs> almost like it was planned. Like almost that. like it was planned. Yeah, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, bang. So, yeah, they, they, it's going to be. An, I think I'm looking forward to a, a quite a, a good, strong summer of, you know, positivity and uh, mm. you know, people mm. trading and not just you know about business, but you know, being able to express ourselves again and meet up with loved ones and all of that. But from a business point of view, this, your businesses are still, you know, you still sell to human beings. It's human to human. You know, I've never really yeah. got into the whole business to consumer, business to business thing. It's human to human. And when you get that right, then your business has a, a more of an organic feel to it and a more human heart to it. And that's what this yeah, is all yeah. about. This has been a, a human challenge, not just a business one as well. Right. And you, yeah, so capture the mood mm. of the people. And that mood is going to be very enthusiastic, very buoyant. So you should be reflecting that in everything you do. Look, and I do know it's been a very buoyant conversation as well. It's been great talking to you. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get you back on again. Look, when you've written another book. Yeah. Perhaps. Have you got another one on? Well, you've got another one on the way. Have you been using the lockdown to get writing? I've actually used it to, um, formulate ideas because I sort of say, I think what's, this is going to be a retrospective as opposed to in anybody sort of coming out with any real theories about what's going to happen next. I think, yeah, there's going to be some informed uh, insight in there, but it's still, I'm still not sure. Mm. Um, I mean, from an economic point of view, I don't think something doesn't make sense. You know, the markets are up, have been up for ages, you know, S and P 500 are driving that a lot, but on the other hand, people still sitting on money, but also on the other hand, unemployment you know where, where where's all the no. No money going you know so there's, there's a few kind of things that i don't think make sense but those will play out over time um so i think you know in a year's time i'll probably have a book saying you know look what happened you know what's the dynamic and what were the new industries that were created by lockdown that's that's what i've been doing over the last sort of you know six or eight months just thinking about Where's this going to go? What's it going to look like? And how's it going to shape up for, for my clients when they're at the other side? Yeah. Well, we, we, as you say, we don't know, do we? But we can live in hope that it's going to be a, a, a very joyous, successful and uh, fruitful uh, and profitable uh, few months that are ahead for all of us. Great to talk, Richard. We'll get you on again soon, hopefully. Thank you. Look forward to it. Take care. Thanks. Bye. And very quickly before we go, let's have a look at what's in the papers uh, this morning. It's all about the royal family again. Oh, yawn. Apparently, uh, Charles and William have had talks with uh, with Harry. They've had a secret summit and they've not been productive. Or so Harry has told a media friend, Gail King, who just happens to be the host of CBS this morning. Uh, yeah, secret talks. We'll, we'll just uh, we'll just blab to people who are a mouthpiece on uh, breakfast TV. Blow to Royal Peace Summit, says the front page of the Daily Express. Betrayal of trust, says the Daily Mail. The Metro's got a picture of Prince Philip being driven home. Yeah, because he's out of hospital after, what was it, four weeks, five weeks? So did I miss anything, is their headline. Almost exactly the same for the Daily Star, the same picture of the prince, uh, looking like he is over 100 years old, I have to say. He's looking rather gaunt and frail and white. Uh, the Daily Star, yes, has the uh, the picture with the speech bubble. What did I miss? Same line, really. Those not leading with the royals this morning are leading with the vi uh, the virus. In the AstraZeneca jab is being weaponized by EU leaders, says the I today. EU leaders are being blamed for fueling vaccine hesitancy. Well, I mean, I mean, just look at the numbers. The UK now close to 40% vaccinated. The European Union, less than 12%. France, less than 11%. Hence the headline in the uh, Daily Mirror. The fact that we're doing so well. Coronavirus on the run. Deaths plummet by 86% in the over 80s after vaccine success, it says. Now, look, later on today... It's the meeting of the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee. This is the group uh, that has the real power in the United States. Forget about the president. It's the Fed. They determine interest rates and also how many government bonds the central bank is going to buy on the open market. In other words, 
the scale of quantitative easing. Now, there could be some market reaction to that. It's on this evening, our time, and we'll be talking about it first thing tomorrow morning with Callum Pickering from Behringer's, one of our regular markets commentators. And Friday, well, I think we're probably going to be talking consumer finance with Jasmine Bertels. That's where we'll go in the diary for Friday. Before any of that, get on Twitter and make the most of your newfound freedom to use the word Memphis. Without facing a ban, this has got to be Memphis Day, hasn't it? Uh, and get in touch as well uh, to Phil at it's the dot business or on Twitter. Uh, can you tell me the eight artists singing about Memphis? Memphis. Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, my man to Memphis. From Memphis. There's a lot on in Memphis. You've got to move Memphis That's what I'll do it is a bit of a worry, isn't it, when an algorithm can run a mock like that? Uh, makes you wonder uh, what happens normally. What you know, who's being blocked uh, unnecessarily on Twitter or on other social media? Now it is back, just in time, on Twitter, so that people can start tweeting about the storm that's expected there this morning. Actually, large hail, damaging winds, and tornadoes will be possible. Thank God we don't have tornadoes in this country. Just the possibility of slightly heavier than normal wind. Uh, and perhaps a little more intense drizzle. That's about the worst it gets, isn't it? Phil at It's The Dot Business. Uh, the, your n- response to that, songs about Memphis. Uh, who, are, who are they? Who's singing in those songs? Or any other comments you might have about the show? Uh, maybe your thoughts on starting up at your business again as lockdown eases. Do you want to add to the list of things that you should be doing, uh, having listened to today's show? Uh, and thoughts for future editions of the podcast as well. But that'll do for today. Tell your friends about us. Make sure you subscribe. I'm Phil Dobby. See you tomorrow morning. It's the business with Phil Dobby. Listen online at it's the dot business or wherever good podcasts.